Uh, my name is Emily and I'm from uh, Auto Niche. Auto Niche is my own company. I run a repair shop out in Markham. So I had the pleasure of driving east today um, and coming into Kingston. So thank you for having me here. Um, so at my shop, we've been in business next year, it will be 10 years. I am a licensed automotive service technician, so I do fix cars. Um, and then about 10 years ago, nine years ago, let's say, is when I started my own repair shop. So like I said, we're located in Markham. Um, this is a facility. We moved into this building a year and a bit ago. Um, I was at another location that we had three bays, so three hoists and five parking spots and we doubled in our size. So now we have actually five bays plus two floor um, uh, bays, I guess we'd call them. And then we have a, a, a bunch of parking, which is great. For an auto repair shop, parking is really, really, really crucial. Uh, just shots of my team, we did this on Facebook. So we just posted stuff that we were thankful for. So I run a team, um, it's myself, my lead technician. I have uh, two apprentices and I also have a, a part-time bookkeeper as well as another admin person. We like to do fun things at the shop. So every twice a year, I, we do social events. So we went to Jungle Cat World. Have you guys heard of Jungle Cat World? Yeah, so we got to play with the tigers and that was fun. So um, we do that twice a year. We try to do different social events. We also love to um, do community work as a group, as a team. So this was packing shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child, if you guys have heard of them before. Um, like I said, we're a fun shop and uh, I was on a juice cleanse recently. Do you guys know what a juice cleanse is? It's like you only drink juice. And that was the week that everybody else in my shop decided they were going to bring in chicken and ribs and pizza and everything. It just tortured me the whole week. Um, so a few shots of me working on cars. Um, so as you can see, I'm not the biggest technician around. And so I would typically at my shop, um, I would do the smaller jobs, so things under the dash. I would do a lot of engine work as well, so that's me right in the engine bay. Um, because I couldn't you know, reach that far over, I just decided to get right in there. Um, this one, actually, believe it or not, I was just changing a headlight bulb, but in order to do this, if anybody has an older Mazda 6, um, you have to pull the entire front fender just to change a light bulb. Okay, so if any of you have comments of, well, it's so easy to change a bulb, well, yes and no. Um, and then I'm also a certified child car seat technician, and so we do that at the shop as well. And us installing child car seat, we get right in there. By the time I'm done with it, when I shake that child car seat, the whole car is moving. That's how tight we get it in. So at my shop, again, like I said, we play to each other's strengths. So because I'm not the biggest one around, usually I'll get the dash jobs, the engine jobs, and that's playing to my strength. That's not to say that the guys couldn't do it, but they're probably doing a lot more stretches than me by the end of that job, right? And then on the other hand, some of the guys, they'll take the bigger jobs. Um, so it's not to say that I can do it, but same thing, we're playing to our strengths. How many of you guys play sports? Okay, so if you play sports, you know that you have your own strengths, right? Whether you're a defender or if you're on the offensive side or you're the goalie. You know, it's not to say that you can't play the other positions, but we are naturally geared towards certain things. And so being part of a good team means that we play to each other's strengths. So a little bit about my journey. I graduated high school in Toronto, in North York, and at the time I wanted to uh, pursue a degree at the University of Waterloo in psychology and business. I graduated with that degree. I then went on to become a psychometrist for a couple of years. How many of you guys have heard of a psychiatrist or a psychologist? Okay, so a psychometrist is somebody who does all of the psych testing. So I would have one patient with me, five hours at a time, I'd probably give them 10 or so uh, tests. How many of you guys have taken those survey questions? Like, what do you like to do, right? Okay, so by the end of five hours, I would be testing them on their pain, on their depression, on their intelligence, aptitude, and I would run all the data and then give the report over to the psychologist and then we would make recommendations. So that's what I did for a couple of years. After that, I missed the business side of things, so I moved into human resources, and human resources are the people responsible for hiring, firing, payroll compensation, training and development. So I moved into that. Um, and then at that time, I then moved to my father's business and I became a project manager for him. Now, he has um, an auto parts wholesale business. So he actually sells to the people that I now buy from. And at the time, I knew the product. So we were selling brake rotors. And um, I knew the product, I knew how to make it, I knew how to package it, I knew how to ship it, I knew how long it took to come from overseas, but I didn't actually know the technical aspect of 
the part. Uh, when I was on maternity leave with my second one, so that would be the little guy there, um, I decided I was going to go to trade school to Centennial College for a pre apprenticeship program and do level one of the trade. And at the time, I had just thought, you know what, I want to learn a little bit more about my car. And I figured, you know, taking my own car in for service, I'll know a little bit more there. I figured if I knew a bit more about the industry too, that would help me in my current, in my job with my father's company. So then I did that. I went through level one. Now, at the time, my oldest was about two and a half. My youngest was three months old. And I will always say this, I was probably one, I'm one of the few females that come out of that program because there aren't really that many girls in it yet. But I'll probably be one of the very few lactating women coming out because at the time, <laughs> my youngest is three months old. So I would wake him up at five o'clock in the morning. I would nurse him. I would go to trade school in between shop classes. I would go to the other side of Centennial, pump milk, store milk in the fridge. And then I would go back to shop class and I would do this for however many months trade school was. And it taught me a lot about sacrifice and commitment. Um, and I get asked a lot about, you know, balancing career and family and, and all that. And what I would say to you guys is if that's something that you want, it can be done. You just need to be prepared for sacrifices and be prepared to commit. So after I finished level one, I had to decide if I was going to go back to my father's oh. company. Um, around that time, I became a Christian and I really felt like God was calling me to open up a shop. And so I decided, you know what, if I'm going to be a mechanic, I'll fix cars. If I'm going to be a parent, I'll discipline my kids and teach them. If I'm going to be a student, hopefully I'll do some studying, right? So if I'm a Christian, I will follow my faith. And so I decided to do that. So I had level one under my belt. I was coming out of mat leave and I had the conversation with my dad. Hey, dad, I'm not coming back to work for you. I'm going to go learn how to fix cars. I'm going to go and open up a repair shop. And by the way, my cousin was working for him at the time. By the way, she's coming with me and she's going to be my service advisor. So that was in one conversation. You'll have to ask him how he really felt about the whole thing. But um, needless to say, after that point, we moved forward. And so now, like I said, we're ten, uh, next year will be 10 years in. So I ended up opening up the shop, building the business. I went back to trade school while I was running the business, did level two, three, and then challenged exam, got my CFQ, um, continued on in the trade. And by 2015, we started hiring apprentices. And now most of my job is running the business. It is managing employees, the operational stuff. Um, every now and again, if they need me back on the floor, I will go back on. But truthfully, most of my day is now operational. Across Canada and around the world, skilled tradespeople are in high demand. If you like to work with your hands and solve problems, these opportunities could be the beginning of a satisfying career in the skilled trades. Not everyone belongs in an office. In fact, many tradespeople prefer to be actively engaged in their day-to-day -day work, immediately able to see their efforts come to life. They report a sense of accomplishment from their work and are often paid well beyond the Canadian average. Tradespeople use the latest technology and tools to turn plans into reality, concepts into three-dimensional solutions. Mechanical ability, good hand-eye coordination and strong math skills are a great foundation for success in the trades. Are you looking for a creative outlet? Tradespeople often use their imagination and creativity to turn raw materials into the products we use every day. Others keep the lights on, the water flowing, and our homes heated. They build, operate, and maintain the physical infrastructure we take for granted. Before you pursue someone else's idea of a good future, consider the unlimited career options in the skilled trades. Crane operators, boiler makers, auto mechanics and hairdressers are just a few of more than 300 trades occupations. And your career path doesn't stop with certification. Tradespeople are in high demand as trades instructors, supervisors, and inspectors. Many go on to own their own businesses. It can all start with an apprenticeship, a unique post-secondary option that combines on-the-job training with time in school. Best of all, you get paid while you learn new skills and gain practical on-the-job experience. The future belongs to those who build it. Want to get started? The Canadian Apprenticeship Forum invites you to learn more at careersintrades.ca. Okay. 
So why I like being a technician? One is that I get an immediate response. So fixing a car, somebody comes in with a car running rough, I can pretty much do my diagnosis, replace parts, and within that day, find out if what I did made a difference. So if you're that kind of person who likes that immediate uh, gratification or response, then skill trades might be for you. Whereas when I was in HR, we would roll up, we would design a program, roll out a program, maybe take about six months or so to measure it, come back, make some tweaks, roll it back out again. Um, and so it was a longer response time for me to gauge if what I did made a difference. The other reason why I like being a technician is because I now have a choice, right? So let's say I'm driving and I get a flat tire um, and I know how to change the spare, the spare tire, right? But if I know how to change it, I also have the option of calling for roadside assistance. For example, if I'm headed to the wedding and I'm all decked out and I just don't want to get dirty for whatever reason, I have the choice to call roadside too, right? But if I didn't know how to change the spare tire, what would my choice be? Yeah, to call somebody, right? So um, knowing how to do it myself gives me that flexibility and the choice. It's not to say that I'll take up the choice to change it every time, but I have the choice available to me. Um, the other thing that I like is that our trade is Red Seal, which means that I can go anywhere in Canada and my designation is recognized. How many of you guys are thinking you might want to do some traveling? After school or in your career? Okay. Um, so one of my good friends, she is a, um, a boiler maker, and we had this great conversation about the fact that, you know, with a skilled trade, you can go anywhere in the world, and it's like having a common language almost, because fixing a car, fixing brakes here is going to be very similar to fixing brakes out in Germany, fixing brakes in China, fixing brakes in Brazil. Give me the car, give me the parts and the tools, and I can pretty much demonstrate to you that I can fix it. Whereas, you know, if I was in HR again and I got posted out to Germany um, and to run a program there, I would have cultural things to get over. I would have the language barrier to get over as well. So it's not to say that I can't do it, but I have a few more challenges. And so if you're thinking that you might want to do some traveling, having a skilled trade is also a benefit for you. Um, how do you guys play music? Like a musical instrument or you sing, something like that. Okay, it's kind of the same thing where music is a, is a universal language, right? We don't necessarily have to understand each individual country's language. We can get together, bring our instruments, and start jamming, right? So that's another reason why I like um, being a technician. Aside from all the things that I've said that I do, I also write for a trade magazine. So this magazine goes out to auto repair shop owners, and I write about things like human resources um, and different technologies that are coming out as well. I blog as well about how to take care of your car. I also road test vehicles for manufacturers, so I will pick up a, ma a vehicle from each manufacturer once a week, drive it for the week, review it, post it online, and then switch out the cars. Um, so these are some vehicles that I got uh, this year. I also have the opportunity to go to different media events, so different press launches. So when GMC launched their Sierra earlier this year, I went to Detroit with them. Um, Cadillac launched their Super Cruise technology where you can drive hands-free on the highways, and I went out to Quebec with them. Bridgestone did an event out in Bowmanville, uh, and we got to race their little Van Diemen cars, so that was a fun one too. And last week I was in England. Because of the review work that I do with the manufacturers, um, the publication that I work with, they are a technology um, website, and so I had the opportunity to go out to England to uh, review this new cell phone from Huawei that is coming out in November. I've also done a few TV things and just talking about car safety, car maintenance, car tips. And I show you guys all of this just to say that, you know what, if you're a licensed technician, that doesn't end there. Your career really is what you want it to be. So if you want to start doing journalism, you want to start doing reviews, you want to start traveling across the world to do other things, like you can. It's totally possible. I'm also a professor at Georgian College in the Automotive Business School. Um, so I teach two classes there, so they are on study week there too, so I hope my students are studying as well. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, 
about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things they push the human race forward and while some may see them as the crazy ones we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do Okay, how many of you guys recognize some of the people in that video? A few, right? How, how many of you guys remember when the Apple logo was still that color? <laughs> okay, so one thing I decided going to the trade was that I had to start thinking differently about what being in the trade meant. So a lot of people were hung up about my gender, about me being a girl, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But I decided going in that really the only person that I could control was myself. The only person that I could change in terms of thinking was myself. And I wasn't there to prove anybody else right or wrong. I was just there to go and learn the skills to become a technician, and that was it. Do you guys recognize these people? Yeah? Who's the one on the right? Michael Jordan, right? The lady on the left, anybody recognize her? She's Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook. So right now, I want you guys to think of your own role model. Who is somebody that you look up to? Who is somebody that you admire? Maybe you know them, maybe you don't. Maybe they're their celebrity, maybe they're a family member, maybe they're a friend. If you have somebody in your mind, can you put your hand up just so I can gauge how many of you guys are? OK, so for the role models that you have, what I wanted to ask you is, what is the quality of this role model that you like, that you consider them to be your role model? If you can just shout it out. So I heard determination, courage, caring, funny. Let's try it for two more. So smart, compassionate, and innovative. So here's the thing. I've asked this question many, many times over. And not once do I ever get the response that, oh, they're a guy or they're a girl. Every single time I ask, it's because of all of these qualities. So would you agree with me that whether you're a male or female, you could have these qualities? And you can work towards the qualities. Whether or not you're a licensed technician, or you're a doctor, a lawyer, or you're a millwright, you can have these qualities, right? So this is what we're after. It's not about gender. It is about your qualities. You know, the, people say uh, it's all about who you know. Have you heard this? It's about who you know. And I just want to suggest to you that, yes, it is who you know, but it's also about what people know of you when it comes to your career. So for me, I really do try to impress upon students that gender isn't an issue until you make it an issue. And there are benefits with getting together with like-minded people. So there are benefits to us getting together as women to discuss things in the trade, just as there are benefits to me getting together with other business owners, other entrepreneurs, just as there's benefits to me getting together with other basketball fans, right? So we have our own little cluster of groups that we can get together with, but it's never to say that one gender can do it or can't do it. And like I said, gender isn't an issue until you make it one. So back in trade school, a lot of people were hung up about the fact that I was a girl, right? And every time or any time that they say something towards my gender, I would always try to bring the conversation back to skill. The skill trades really is about skill. At the end of the day, when my client comes to me with a car that's broken, they want the car fixed. Maybe bonus that it's done by a girl, but they are paying for that job to be done, for that skill to be there. Do you guys sell car pumpkins? I don't know if you guys are at the age, yeah? <laughs> OK, so this is my husband. He cars pumpkins, and he's clearly skilled at this, because when I do it, it's like two triangles for the eyes, and then like. You know, a mouth, maybe I'll put a little indent for the mouth to show the pumpkin lost its tooth, I don't know. But I am not skilled at it. And so we all have different strengths, right, in terms of our skill. And part of our journey in the careers is to figure out, okay, what is it that we're really good at? And what is it that we're not really that good at? And that we're okay with what we're not good at. And that we excel in what we can do well. These are just pictures of my kids and um, my bookkeeper's kids, too. We were doing tire changes with them. And the thing about these trades is that it's hands-on. 
You can't just look at it and stand by and say, hmm, I think I can do that. Skill trades, we really have to get in there and do it. And the more times you do it, the better you get at it. Okay, before I was 28 years old, I did not know there were three different types of screwdrivers. If you asked me for a screwdriver, I would have handed you a flathead every single time. I had no idea. Not until I got into trade school and I learned that there were three. And now, uh, when you ask me for a screwdriver, I'll be sure to ask you which one you want. At the time when I was with the guys, right, they were all like laughing that I didn't know about these screwdrivers. And honestly, I was laughing too. And to me, I just chalked it up to the fact that, you know what, I just never learned it. Nobody ever taught me, and now I learned it today, and forever I will always remember, right? So again, the focus is on acquiring the skills you need to become successful in the trade that you choose. Okay, since I have you guys as a captive audience right now, I'm gonna share a little bit of an automotive tip. How many of you guys have ever seen people drive into the gas station, and they get out of the car, they're ready to pump, and then they realize that the fuel door is on the wrong side of the car? Then they have to get back into the car, do a little UE, spin around, okay. So most vehicles now, probably 95% of vehicles now, on the instrument cluster has a little arrow to show you where this fuel door is. Okay, so I know this um, screen is a little bit further back, but can you see the arrow right here? Some of you guys in the front maybe can see there's a little arrow next to this fuel. So if I'm, if I'm sitting in the car looking at it, I know my fuel door is on the left side. Okay. On this one, the fuel door is, the indicator is actually right over here. Okay, and it's pointing to the right side. This one, this one you guys can probably see a little bit more, right? So fuel door is on the left side. Anybody find it here? Yeah, on the left side. Okay, so you guys now know, right? Something you didn't know and something you now know and forever you will never be that person that I see make a UE at the gas station, right? And who knows, like ask your parents, maybe they didn't know this too. But again, it's all about learning something that you didn't know before. And like I said, forever now you will know. Okay, another question that I get asked is, how do I work in a male dominated trade, right? So <laughs> it's really interesting actually, because the principles are the same, whether you work in a male dominated trade or not, but I, it always comes back to communication for me. So I want to know what you guys say. What do you think the average number of words spoken by a male is each day? How many words do you think the guys in this room, on average, will speak in one day? Six? Did you say six? 2,500. OK, a little higher. 5,000. OK, we're getting close. So 7,000. So now that you know men on average speak 7,000 words a day, I'm gonna ask you, how many words do you think the average, men are not allowed to answer this. <laughs> You'll get it wrong anyway. How many words on average do you think a female speaks in a day? How much? 6,000? Less than the men? It's higher than the men. 9,000 higher. 11,000 higher, what are you guys? Double, so 14,000? Okay, higher. 20,000, 20, okay. I feel like some of the men in the room are like, yeah, huh? <laughs> okay, so knowing this, it kind of makes sense, right? Like on average, I'm not saying that every man is gonna speak 7,000, this is on average. There's some guys that talk more, there's some women that talk less. I certainly talk less, um, but it makes sense, right? Because women were like, you know, how are you? Men are more like, hey, right? <laughs> this is a conversation I have with, so I have two boys, they're 10 and 12, and I'm always like, you know, how was school? Good. What'd you do? Stuff, you know? So <laughs> conversation with my boys is, you know, I got to pull it out of them. So knowing this, if it's a male dominated, sorry, male dominated trade, okay? And I'm going into the world, See, here's the thing. There's two ways you can influence people, right? You can either force it down them, the influence, or you can try to bring it from the bottom up. And I'm just pitching to you guys that this is how I did it. I believe in going from the bottom up. So I knew walking into their world that they're gonna talk one third less than me, right? That they were gonna be more task oriented, generally speaking, were in the trades, right? 
So I really did put a conscious effort to tailor my communication to them. And once they realized that I was there for the same reason that they were, that I wasn't going to be using my gender as an excuse, that I was there to work and learn and get the skills that I needed, I ended up doing very well in trade school. I was one of 40 students. Um, and in level one, I played highest in my engines class. By the time I got to level three, I played highest across all three levels, uh, all level threes that went through that school that year. So I did really well. And you know, ladies, when you start doing well, guys are really competitive, right? So they started noticing. And, they, and eventually, I earned their respect that way. And that's how I was able to uh, manage my time uh, in trade school and on the floor, too. Okay? And it makes sense, because think about it this way. How many of you guys are, do you guys know the difference between an introverted and an extroverted person? Okay. So introverted person, well, let's say this this way. Extroverted person, you get recharged by lots of people, right? That you go to parties, you're very social. Introverted person, you get recharged more uh, by yourself, whether it's reading a book or prayer or whatever it is. So the, the quiet time is what you like. So how many of you guys would say that you're introverted? Okay. How many of you guys would say that you're extroverted? Okay. And know this, uh, whichever one you are, you can play in the other field, right? If, but which one do you naturally tend to be? So here's the deal. Can you imagine? So I'm, I'm naturally introverted, but can you imagine if I, you know, was a super extroverted person and then I had an introverted person come to me and start talking? And, you know, as an introverted person, I go up to this super extroverted person and it's going to feel like we're not communicating at the same level, right? Because I may be more reserved, I may not give as much detail, they might be more animated, they might be more excited, more happy, and so it's gonna come off like we're not exactly speaking at the same level. Do you see what I mean? And so part of our journey in growing in terms of becoming successful in our career, successful in our relationships, is understanding how we can communicate with the other people. And it's no different than working with guys in the trade. Just understanding how they communicate, understanding how I communicate, and working together in the space. So can you adjust your communication style? And are you willing to adjust your communication style? Part of our journey is to discern who really has our best interests at heart. So you're going to have some people that will say no. That'll be the naysayers. I don't know if you guys have people like that in your life already, where they're just constantly like poo-pooing on your party, right? The truth is that what they say about you shows you more about them than anything else. So I'll give you an example. Sometimes I get the comment that, you know, when people find out I fix cars, they say things like, oh, you don't look like a mechanic, right? And to me, if you say that to me today, that's a good thing, because I actually tried, I showered, brushed my hair, right, got all clean. If you looked at me now and said, oh yeah, I can see that, I would be thinking, okay, did I have something dirty on me? Like, is there, am I not, because I'm not in my shop clothes at all, right? And so when they say that, what it shows me is that they have a perception of what a mechanic should look like that I don't fit into. It really is nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with what their perception is. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, so somebody who is in your corner, who's cheering you on, somebody who genuinely supports you, they will tell you things like, yeah, you know what, I can definitely see you doing that. And even if they say no, even if they say, you know what, I don't think that's a good idea, they'll also at the same time affirm you in things that you are good at. So again, part of our journey is to discern who really has our best interests at heart and understanding that what they say really is a reflection of them and not always a reflection of you. I'm going to close with this. How many of you guys watch the Raptors? OK. I love watching the Raptors. And this is any sports team, really. I love watching the Raptors. Um, they always give me a heart attack at the third quarter because it always seems like to be when they are just falling apart. I don't know. Maybe because they have to run the other way. I don't know. At any rate, any sports team you want, doesn't matter which one you want to pick. But imagine this with me. Imagine we're watching a live Raptors game tonight. They're playing, I think, Minnesota. Imagine we're watching it, right? Every time we score, what's the environment like? Yeah, we're all cheering, excited, extroverted people are even more happy, right? And every time the other team scores, right, every time we get a penalty, every time we get a foul, 
it's very emotional, right? High and low. OK, now imagine that we saw the same game on the highlight reel. We already know what the score is. We already know <coughs> Toronto won, of course. Right? And now we're just watching all the baskets that go in, whether it's from our team or their team. Do you think that your emotion level would be a little bit different? OK, why? OK, yeah, because you didn't follow the game, and you didn't follow like, all the stuff that happened before it. Why else would, you, would your emotion be a little bit different? You already know the score, right? That's what you mean. You already know that we won or lost. And so every basket that we put in and every basket that they put in, we're just now watching it on the highlight reel to admire the shot, really. But there's less high and low, right? So what if life was like that? What if at the end of the day you knew you were going to be that successful technician? What if at the end of the day you knew you were going to be able to travel the world? You knew you were going to have that family that you wanted. You knew that you could be that lawyer that you want to be. You knew you could be that bricklayer that you want to be. What if, at the, what if life was like that where you just knew you could really achieve what you wanted to? Then every time you have a high and low, every time you miss the mark on the weld, every time you didn't pull the mark that you wanted to on a test, it wouldn't be as emotionally high and low for you, right? So part of our life journey is getting people in our corner who can see us to the very end, who can say, you know what? Yeah, you can do it. Absolutely. There's no reason why you can't. So I hope that my talk gave you guys a little bit more uh, points to consider in terms of coming into the skilled trades. And I really do appreciate spending this time with you. And I hope you have a really good day today exploring. So thank you.